Hi, everyone. Thanks for interrupting your potential happy hour to listen to me for a few minutes. Uh, it's 8 to 2 Atlanta, or I'm sorry, Philadelphia, in case anybody's watching on their phone. Uh, but I uh, just wanted to give you a quick overview. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Regenex Bio. Uh, this is the forward-looking statement sheet. Please read it at your leisure. And uh, just to introduce the company a little bit, we have a 5 by 25 strategy, meaning by 25, 2025, we expect to be uh, either through in the process of a BLA uh, review or approval and in pivotal studies with some of our programs by that point uh, across five different uh, indications. And to do that, we focus most of our work on AAV therapeutics, primarily AAV8 and AAV9 are the two serotypes that we work with. Uh, mostly, but we have new ones in research that are being developed. Uh, uh, about a year and a half to two years ago, we uh, signed a strategic partnership with AbbVie <clears throat> for what's called RGX314, uh, and that is a program that's in phase three right now <clears throat> with two pretty large studies uh, in subretinal administration. And we also, in the last year, uh, area near and dear to my heart, uh, stood up an internal manufacturing capability at our site in Rockville, Maryland, and I'll talk about some of the work there uh, that relates to manuf manufacturing. So our pipeline, um, sometimes to employees, I say it's a bit of a Whitman sampler for the old timers in the room that remember what a Whitman sampler is, which we have a little bit of everything. Uh, we have uh, indications that are uh, very broad uh, in terms of patient population, like wet AMD with the subretinal trial. We also have a different mode of delivery uh, for wet AMD and diabetic retinopathy, which is a suprachoroidal in-office administration that's in uh, phase one, two development uh, as we speak. Having said that, we also have uh, some ultra uh, rare uh, diseases that we're working on uh, which are the Hunter syndrome, MPS2, and Hurler syndrome, uh, MPS1 as programs, and also a Batten program, uh, all delivered to the CNS. And then sandwiched in between, um, an IV administration for the Duchenne program uh, that we just uh, gave some new updates on recently, uh, which is called RGX202. So really we are, for a 400-person company, um, involved in a wide variety of therapeutic areas um, and including a wide variety of delivery capabilities, which is one of our specialties. I'll focus a little bit today on the Duchenne program. Um, I won't go through every aspect of this slide, uh, but we feel like uh, Duchenne is an area where there's going to be room uh, and there's going to be growth uh, in this area. You see uh, programs moving through the late stages and, and including a accelerated approval. Um, and our program began in the clinic uh, earlier this year. And uh, we just did some uh, data releases at the World Muscle Society about some of our very early results, which uh, look very encouraging. And today I want to talk just a little bit about how our program is differentiated from others um, and some of the things that we're looking for as we progress this in the clinic. So the RGX202, um, this slide and the next one will show you a little bit about what's different. As I said, we have a lot of experience with AAV8. Uh, that's one of the main components of what we call the NAV technology. Um, and it's been pretty widely used in the industry. And RGNX uh, began years ago, seven or eight years ago, well, actually longer than that, as a licensing company, and then we decided to begin internalizing our, our programs, and some of the early licenses that we granted were based on AAV8 and as well some on AAV9. Uh, but now we've harnessed that uh, capability and established safety platform for AAV8, um, and we've included a, a differentiated promoter for RGX202, and then actually microdystrophin, even though there's a class of microdystrophins out there. There are some differences in our microdystrophin, uh, which we feel may lead to differential efficacy in the clinic, and that's what we're currently exploring. So if you sort of line this up with other programs you might be familiar with, 
So we're, we're going with a different serotype than Sarepta and Pfizer with AAV8, a different promoter, which is heart and skeletal muscle specific. And then our uh, transgene has what's called the CT domain associated with it, which may give a differential performance in its recruitment and uh, ability to repair uh, muscle. This part I won't go into a lot of detail, um, given that I'm not a molecular biologist, but uh, again, uh, we made a conscious effort uh, to match as closely as possible, and I think if you listen to the ADCOM uh, for Sarepta, people were comparing microdystrophin to, quote, natural dystrophin. We feel our molecule and our construct is closer to some of the elements of natural dystrophin, and that, again, may give us an advantage uh, as we look at patient outcomes. So the study that's uh, currently underway uh, is uh, for eligibility cr uh, criteria, boys aged 4 to 11, so a fairly broad range of age groups that uh, are in our inclusion criteria. Um, and of course, we do the pre-screening uh, that is similar to other programs in terms of patient inclusion. And one of the key things, and you think about the Duchenne market, is do people have pre-existing antibodies to certain serotypes, which is one of the reasons that we chose one that was unique from the others. Uh, we're now through our first cohort, uh, and that was the data that we released at World Muscle Society, and uh, we reported both safety uh, updates at that meeting. So far, things look really good for the first three patients, and we also reported efficacy for the first two patients. The third one is still in progress, and we're showing really good levels of microdystrophin expression, which is really key uh, to performance. So. Um, the data that we're seeing is really confirming a lot of our preclinical work, and now the focus for us is dose escalation to what we hope will be our pivotal dose, which is roughly uh, 2E14 uh, GC per kg, and that should happen as we uh, disclosed uh, sometime later this year. And our intent would be uh, to expand that cohort potentially into a pivotal study in 2024. So the measurements that we're making are, again, fairly similar to other programs, but uh, we're looking at microdystrophin expression at three months with a biopsy approach. And of course, we're looking along the way um, at function at discrete three, six, nine, and 12 month time points. Um, so, so far, again, uh, really, really happy with the safety profile that we've seen at the first dose and uh, anxious to get moving to the next uh, next cohort. So this is just a bit of a repeat. Uh, we, we did, I don't have the specific data here, but you can find it uh, regarding microdystrophin levels. There was a press release issued um, showing uh, what we've measured, which for uh, one of the patients was approximately 40% um, microdystrophin relative to normal. Um, and uh, we found uh, from some of the staining data that we did that we had localization where we expected to see it. Um, and serum CK levels, which are an indicator of muscle health, uh, were uh, improved for sure uh, in, in the first set of data. This is um, uh, uh, just a quick insert. Uh, if you go back, one of the main models for Duchenne is the MDX mouse model. It's quite uh, uniformly used. And one of the reasons that we're anxious to escalate to the 2E14 dose is shown here. And I would primarily point you to the treadmill exhaustion data. You can see uh, clear restoration at the 1E14 dose, which was our cohort one level. Uh, but then you see uh, restoration almost back to wild type uh, levels on treadmill exhaustion at the 2E14 dose. And I think historically, uh, while animal models can be unpredictable in many cases, um, for Duchenne, the MDX mouse model is quite predictive in terms of dose for dose. How do you see the results in the clinic? So this sort of underscores our excitement to, to move to that dose level and see Number one, of course, uh, is that a safe dose, and uh, we have good reasons to believe it will be based on our initial information, uh, but also can we maximize efficacy per, for patients. 
And as I said, uh, our expectation will be to dose uh, and expand that cohort and then as quickly as possible move to a pivotal plan next year. One of the main aspects, uh, a lot of our experience as a company was in ocular, still is, <laughs> and also uh, in CNS. So in those particular indications, the amount of vector required, even though for wet AMD, for example, you have a large patient population, maybe 100,000 patients out there, so cumulative, you can have a significant vector demand for those programs. But uh, moving into Duchenne for us meant also investing significantly in manufacturing because this is an IV dose. It's probably the highest set of, you know, if you look at indications, Duchenne is probably the highest dose uh, uh, gene therapy that's out there. And so there has to be a lot of attention paid to manufacturing capability. Um, and long term having a commercial ready process. And our uh, plan for this was to actually start our pivotal study with commercial grade process uh, and processes that would not have to change significantly through the pivotal plan. And I'll show you some data uh, on, on that here, uh, which is generated, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in our Manufacturing Innovation Center. This is located in Rockville, Maryland. We've installed two 2,000 liter bioreactors uh, in the suite. And so we're running large scale triple transfection at 2,000 liters. And we've uh, really, really had good success with linear scale from two liter all the way to 2,000 liters. And I'll give a little bit more specific information next. But the main challenges were investing in the process. So do we have the best cell line uh, for expressing uh, vector? and how can we subclone and improve that cell line to maximize productivity. Uh, and then having a platform process where we literally, across our seven programs, effectively our process is the same other than one of the uh, plasmids that's incorporated and maybe some of the downstream uh, resins. But everything else is identical. So we have a platform process that allows us to move quickly with new programs like the 202 program and then third, paying attention to commercial expectations for drug percent full caps. It is something you hear a lot about, and we're doing really well with that. And the way we're doing that is to enrich the full caps in the upstream process, and that minimizes the burden on the chromatography process and gives us better yields because of that. So I think the, the summary of the manufacturing and a way to think about it is, for each 2,000 liter batch that we run, we can make enough drug at the highest dose for our GX202 to serve 160 patients. And so thinking about that one 2,000 liter batch, if you look at the benchmarking for pivotal studies that are out there, would cover the entire study. So I think that's a really, really significant advance in cost of goods and significant advantage in ability to serve the market. So we plan to leverage that as we move through development. And we call that process NAV Express. Um, it's just a play on words from our NAV technology. Um, you can see the bioreactor there. That's our 2,000 liter uh, bioreactor. And we've uh, completed at the 500 liter scale as well for some of the smaller indications, well over 30 uh, GMP runs now, have lots of experience with it. and so. I think this is a really distinguishing difference for Regenix Bio is our capability to manufacture vector, including manufacturing vector for large indications that are delivered um, via IV. And I won't go through all the detail of this one, but uh, just wanted to thank you for listening and uh, be happy to meet with anybody after the session offline if you want to have a discussion. Thanks for your time. <laughs>